Hello, everyone. Eric Renier here, and welcome to the 80th episode of the RIT podcast. We're now uh, over a year from the last Ontario election, but there's already been lots of drama when it comes to the leadership of the two opposition parties, the Liberals and the New Democrats. The New Democrats have a new leader. The Liberals are looking for a new leader, and they might actually be looking at the leader of another party to become the leader of their party. So there's lots to chat about in Ontario politics. So joining me this week is Serena Nanji of QP Observer and John Michael Gre- John Michael McGrath of TVO.org, a writer at TVO and a co-host with Steve Pakin of the On Poly podcast. Uh, Sabrina and John Michael, thanks so much for joining me. Happy to be here. Um, Before we get into the leadership, uh, we should talk just about the big story this week, which is the health care funding that was proposed by the federal government. So they're proposing $196 billion in spending over the next 10 years. About $46 billion of that is going to be new spending. And it does seem like it is a little bit of a take it or leave it offer from the federal government, not really negotiation, because there's nothing much that the provinces can offer in return. Um, Sabrina, what has been Doug Ford's reaction to the proposal that the feds have put on the table? Yeah, I thought it was really interesting this week to kind of watch Ford change his tune a little bit. You know, leading up to this big meeting with Trudeau this week, uh, he was kind of signaling that Ontario was ready to sign on the dotted line. You know, he was saying we're we're just you know dotting dotting our eyes, crossing our t's, that type of thing. And then once he actually got you know the offer on the table at, in that closed door meeting with Trudeau, uh, he came out and, and sounded a bit more skeptical. You know, called it a starting point. It's a down payment. On, on future talks. And of course, we know that, you know, the deal falls short of what the premiers have been demanding for a long time, um, increasing the Canada health transfers, uh, the Ottawa share of it for, to 35% from 22%. And that's about $28 billion a year. And this is closer to, you know, almost $5 billion, let's say. And so it, it falls far short of what the premiers have wanted. But as you said, this is kind of a take it or leave it offer. And no premier, you know, when all provinces are facing the healthcare crisis that they're facing are, is going to say no to, to money. And so I think that this is more about negotiating the, the details and the fine print of the bilateral agreements. And I think that, you know, we're not going to see a deal tomorrow or anything like that. It might take a couple of weeks, but certainly, you know, all sides want a deal before bud- the budgets come out. And for Ontario, the, the legal deadline is March 31st. You know, the Ford government has broken their own. It's a self-imposed deadline in the past, but uh, Ottawa's budget is is coming out we're expecting soon as well and so I think they're kind of one going to want to get these numbers like down on paper and finalized uh, b- before that at that point so uh, you know a couple of weeks I think we'll, we'll see the final uh, points of that. John Michael it, it seems like the Ford uh, government and the Trudeau government have been in they, they've been working together it seems at least behind the scenes pretty well And this is not a government, you know, two governments that you would expect to work well together, a conservative and a liberal government. Um, So how do you find that the reaction that Ford had this week, how does it square with that kind of relationship that we've seen between the feds and the the province? I think one way to think of it is that these two leaders, the uh, premier and the prime minister, uh, have mostly saved the really uh, public antagonism for things that frankly don't matter as much. Um, healthcare spending really, you know, the single biggest file in the provincial uh, budget. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, even before COVID, it was the kind of file that no premier could really afford to uh, let fall apart. And so this is simply a matter where you really have to have both levels of government uh, rowing in the same direction and um, the, you know, as Sabrina detailed, uh, this is not as much money as the premiers wanted, but it's not no money. And it is, it is more money than they were getting. Um, so th- th- lacking any real leverage uh, with Ottawa, I think the provinces are going to, you know, you know they, they don't frankly have that many options. They are going to have to take the deal and um, uh, and move forward from that. Uh, what I do think is interesting, and like sort of the, the dog that didn't bark, so to speak, is um, the prime minister, at least nothing that I've seen, and, and certainly uh, either of you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I, I didn't see anything from Prime Minister Trudeau about uh, any measures that might 
uh, restrain private delivery of health care. Obviously a, a live issue in Ontario right now. Other provinces are doing this as well. And uh, I know certainly there were lots of uh, Liberals, both provincially and federally, uh, who have been, uh, you know, uh, making dire warnings about uh, what Ontario is doing and, and what it means for the future of health care in this province. Uh, and it, that seems to be a fight that the Prime Minister is not wading into right now. It does seem that uh, the, one of the reasons that we've seen that the Premiers have been disappointed, but not so disappointed, is that there weren't a lot of conditions on this money. Uh, the only thing that's worse than, than not a lot of money is money with conditions. So the fact that they are getting something and they can more or less do what they want with it. There's some, there'll probably be some limitations. It does seem to be something that they weren't expecting as much. Uh, of course, the premiers are always going to be asking for a lot, and they're never going to get exactly what they want. This is not a lot less than maybe what they wanted, but in terms of a negotiating position, they don't really have much of one. Um, so I guess we'll see where this unfolds. And just as you were, you were mentioning, uh, Jagmeet Singh has, has been criticizing the federal liberals for not preventing uh, private delivery in this. So it does seem like this will be an issue that we're going to hear about uh, going forward. Um, okay, so that's the health care funding. Uh, I, I just wanted to touch on it because it, it is such the big story this week. But, you know, this is a podcast largely about electoral politics, so I want to get to the leadership. So the Ontario New Democrats didn't really have much of a leadership race. There was only one, uh, one contestant in it. Uh, Merit Stiles was acclaimed. Uh, they had to move it up just to this past week because the it was going to be the beginning of March, but why bother? They already had the name. Uh, Sabrina, how has the fact that she's been acclaimed, how has that been going over within the NDP? Well, I've actually been hearing some dissent, but it's coming from the usual corners. Um, you know, some outspoken New Democrats who uh, have, you know, called out party brass on, on past behavior before uh, weren't so happy about this being an acclaimed race, uh, you know, having no one else competing in it. I think there were a lot of questions about um, her, you know, Styles' potential competition. We know there was a lot of rumors uh, late in the game last year before the deadline to sign up. Uh, you know, there were rumors about other MPPs running. Um, and so there have been some folks that are, you know, not happy about this. Um, liberals, if you ask any liberal, they are, you know, dining out on the fact that this was an uncontested leadership race. They're saying this was, uh, you know, this is a sign that, you know, there's no energy or fresh engagement with the NDP. And, you know, meanwhile, the liberals, um, I mean, we're, we're going to definitely dig into the leadership drama there. But, you know, even for party president, sort of an inside baseball position, that's already a uh, hotly contested race um, for the the big political nerds out there that are paying attention to that one um, but but you know if you ask Styles and I did uh, she'll tell you know she's flipping the script on this she says this is a sign of party unity everyone is behind her uh, and I think you know especially th there is a bit of a love in they're, they're kind of riding that wave right now um, you know Styles was just acclaimed it was a big party she had uh, you know and pretty much her whole caucus behind her dancing on stage to Diana Ross it was a cute moment um, and, and I think she she does have a bit of an edge here because uh, you know, obviously not having a contested leadership race, you miss out on the media coverage, uh, the potential fundraising and new members that you could sign up. But now, you know, Styles can fully focus on being leader and focus on taking down Doug Ford in 2026. Um, you know, she has kind of already hinted that she, that we might not see much of her in the house. Obviously a lot of folks would want her to look um, premier like, you know, taking Doug Ford to task in question period. And she will be doing some of that. You mentioned they moved up the leadership contest. Contest. I think part of that was because the House comes back in, in February, and so why not have the leader front and center from the get-go? But she'll also be out on the road, too. And so I think that this is going to certainly give her an edge um, over the Liberals, too, because she's going to be out in ridings. She was already in Hamilton Center on this weekend, uh, you know, canvassing with the, the uh, by-election candidate there to replace Andrea Horvath. And so she's really, you know, getting her ground game in order because this, she's playing the long game. And so I think that, you know, at first we were thinking this uncontested race, um, it might be a bad thing for the NDP, but at the end of the day, like Marit Stiles, I think, has really played it to her advantage. If I can uh, put an editorial comment about contested races, there's a big difference between someone who everybody kind of recognizes is going to win and, you know, generally has some support and no one bothers to go up against them. You think of David Eby in uh, British Columbia. That was almost what happened there. And a race where, let's say, the Alberta Liberals or the New Brunswick New Democrats, where they have to cancel a race because no one actually wants to run. 
that's a that's a case when there's not a lot of interest. <laughs> it's not so much, I don't think, when uh, someone is the odds-on favorite. Uh, John Michael, what do you think about Stiles becoming the leader of the New Democrats, what she brings to the party, and whether it does matter that she didn't have to run against anybody? Uh, well, I think her personal uh, attributes are uh, probably a benefit to the party. Uh, you know, a, a new face uh, after a, uh, you know, a substantial chunk of time with Andrew Horvath in the leadership. Uh, I think, you know, uh, Stiles very sort of politely in her acceptance speech uh, alluded to the work that Horvath did to uh, bring the party to where it is today, you know, uh, a second election uh, with uh, a very substantial and very diverse caucus. Uh, you know, it, Obviously, 2022 was a disappointment for the NDP, uh, but relative to uh, every election except 2018, this would have been a really fantastic result for the party historically. Um, you know, so on the one hand, Styles can uh, build from what Horvath uh, left the uh, the NDP, but also, you know. A, a, as I said, a, you know, a, a newer face, a younger face that helps. She's a, uh, a, a, a very engaging public speaker, which is not always a given among uh, uh, MPPs. Uh, and, you know, she has a seat in the legislature and it's not clear that uh, the, the, the next liberal leader, for example, uh, will have a seat in the legislature. Uh, and, and I do think that helps, even if she doesn't want to use it uh, extensively, um, being able to show up in question period and, and grill the premier or grill a minister, uh, that is a, a useful thing. And we saw for the liberals that, uh, you know, Stephen Del Duca was challenged by the fact that he could lead the liberal party and he could, sh he could show up at Queens Park and hold press conferences. But I think it mattered that he couldn't be in the chamber itself. All right. Well, let's get to the liberals because uh, that is, I think, really what we want to chew on here because of the news. Uh, okay, so first off, they do have a decent slate of candidates. For a party that only has eight seats in the legislature uh, and has been struggling over the last two elections, you know, they have two MPPs that have already, you know, no one's officially in because the race hasn't officially started, but you have Ted Tzu, you have Mitzi Hunter. Um, Ted Tzu has also been an MP. Uh, Yasser Nakvi, who is currently an MP, he used to be an MPP. You have Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, who's a liberal MP, who is pretty well known, at least here in Ottawa, because he has taken sometimes positions that are uh, contrary to what the federal liberals are doing. Um, so we do also have the Mike Schreiner candidacy. But before we get into that, Sabrina, these four liberals, uh, how far along are these bids? How exploratory are they? And, or are they just waiting for the actual kind of gun to go off? Well, I think no one is going to actually officially, you know, declare their candidacy until we actually have the outline of the race. And so that's coming very soon, March 3rd to 5th over in Hamilton. The Liberals are going to hold their convention. Uh, they're going to lay out, you know, the details of, of the leadership race, the timeline, um, you know, the, the cost of entry, the rules, that type of thing. And so I think probably after that is when we'll see some of these these folks make it official. But, you know, Nate Erskine-Smith, he's already soliciting donations. He's been out, you know, glad handing around the province. Same same with Ted Shu with Yasser Nakvi and, and even Mitzi Hunter, too. Um, but, you know, I'm not ruling out a dark horse com coming into this. Like, it's still early days yet. And, um, you know, I've also been hearing about uh, Bonnie Crombie, whose name has come up before. You know, the Liberals have had a, a couple of leadership races recently. And so uh, there, there's definitely certainly folks within the party who are trying to draft Bonnie, um, possibly more quietly than they're trying to draft Mike Schreiner, um, which is, you know, a, a separate sect of the, of the party too. But, but, but don't, um, you know, this, this may be, the leadership race itself might actually, you know, look a lot different on the other side of, of March. Uh, and so I'd say these folks are, are very serious contenders. You know, their teams are already coming together, their staff. Uh, and, and so I think, uh, you know, we'll, I, I would say, you know, if you were going to make a bet on it, you know, everyone, the names that we've all mentioned will be will be in, in the race for sure. And it's going to be certainly competitive. Well, it already seems like a better slate than uh, when Del Duca won. Uh, there wasn't re really none of the, none of the people that ran that time, not a lot of them at least, had uh, maybe as many people talking about them as this time, which is an interesting thing after two elections that went badly. Um, John Michael, um, what do you think about where liberals, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll keep it the liberals for now, but where do you think the liberals are positioning themselves ahead of an eventual start to this race? 
Well, I think one thing that people should keep in mind as they watch, especially uh, Sabrina mentioned the uh, convention that's happening in March. Uh, one thing that I've spoken to a few liberals about and they are really thinking about seriously is how the structure of the contest will drive uh, what they hope to be a, uh, you know, a revival of the party's fortunes, right? They, uh, you know, there's, a, a, I think, a recognition that the uh, the party's traditional method of a delegated convention um, did not serve the party's interests in the last uh, round. And they, they are thinking very seriously about not just moving to a weighted one member, one vote the way that other parties have, um, but they are thinking about ideas uh, that could help uh, really drive new membership uh, and, and, you know, spreading the party's uh, footprint outside of just Toronto and Ottawa. Um, and so one idea that I've seen a few liberals discuss is the idea of doing sort of like regional primaries, right? And you would do like, uh, uh, you know, d maybe delegates or points uh, elected from different parts of the province at different times. So it's not just everybody votes over a weekend and then you tally the points three weeks later. Um, they, they, I, I don't know if that is a solution that the, that the party will uh, land on, but they are thinking about those kinds of rules because they really do recognize that the party's in a bad place right now, to be very blunt about it. Um, you know, I know that there's a certain amount of um, uh, people are, are salving some wounds from uh, 2022 by saying that, oh, well, actually, you know, in terms of total, total vote share, we came in uh, second. We actually, you know, came ahead of uh, the NDP. That is true, mathematically, they still only have eight seats in the House. Um, maybe they get their ninth, depending on how things go in Hamilton, uh, to replace uh, Andrea Horvath. But, um, yeah, I, I think the, the, in some sense, it will almost be more important than who the actual winner of the leadership race is, is whether the race can really um, drive that new energy to the party and get a, a sense of this party being a serious contender again, because, uh, you know, and, I, and I, I don't particularly want to beat up on Stephen Del Duca here, but I just, I don't think based on the results of, of last year, I, I don't think you, you could say anything other than he did not revive the party's fortunes. Yeah, it's an understatement. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, John Michael, maybe you can also just bring us quickly up to date about what's been going on with Mike Schreiner. <laughs> Well, um, late last year, uh, we started to hear reports that uh, Schreiner was being wooed privately by some liberals. Uh, and then uh, earlier this month, that uh, went public with an open letter signed by people like uh, Kate Graham and uh, Greg Sorbera, uh, Deb Matthews, other uh, London area liberal uh, politicians. And... Uh, uh, basically asking uh, Mike Schreiner to uh, run in the liberal leadership uh, contest. Uh, the, the letter lays out an argument basically saying that, uh, you know, the party uh, needs, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an odd thing to say that, the, the, you know, the party needs to rediscover the politics of principle. So we need somebody from outside the party to lead it. Um, they insist that that's not actually a backhanded uh, insult to other possible contestants. Um, I'm not sure how it couldn't be, but uh, Mike Schreiner, after previously saying like, no, 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 I'm, I'm absolutely not going to be a, a candidate for the liberal leadership, has now said he's going to take time to uh, take the argument seriously. And, um, you know, uh, we will see uh, what happens. Uh, I, I don't imagine he's going to face a, a lot of pressure to announce any time before we actually know what the rules of the race might be, for example. Um, but, uh, you know, at some point in the next several weeks, uh, we will see what Schreiner eventually decides. It is just, uh, to me, it's a very bizarre story. And, and I think to a lot of other people, too, it's a bizarre story. The Greens took 6% of the vote. They had one seat. The Liberals got 24% of the vote. They got eight seats. They have formed a government before. The Greens, in all of their history, have only elected uh, an MPP twice, and that was Mike Schreiner. Um, it... it and I don't think there's a precedent for this kind of thing. Now, there is precedent for people switching from one party to another, but not so much one leader deciding to become the leader of a completely different party while they're also the leader of the other party. I don't 
I can't remember a historical example of another party leader being wooed to take over a completely different party. Sabrina, and, and what do you also make? We're not talking of, about a merger either. Like a party yeah, merger. That's it. There's plenty of precedent for as well. But yeah. this is just this is something else that is neither, you know, fish nor fowl. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. A merger would be something. Um, but this is not even that. It's abandon your party to come to ours. Sabrina, what do we? What do you make of this? I mean, I was just pulling up um, Queens Park observers. We we rounded up some quotes from some liberals' reaction to this letter from you know their fellow grits. And they called it humiliating, beyond embarrassing, dumbest thing I have ever seen, like from the party. And so I think, you know, this has really backfired in a way. I think that uh, this is a bit of a self own. A lot of liberals are angry about it. I mean, it's so insulting to the folks that are already have already put their names out there as you know, very seriously considering putting putting their their names forward um, for leadership. You know, we mentioned um, Deb Matthews. You know, who's who's worked with Yasser Nakbi. They they were. In cabinet together, uh, you know, Lucille Coyard, current sitting MVP, you know, signed her name to this letter, and she's got fellow Mitzi Hunter there, Ted Shu, who have also said that they want to run. And so, what does it say about what your colleagues think about how you perform already? And and so, I think that this has uh, caused a, a big rift in the party. Um, I don't. I know Shriner said he was thinking about it, you know, before when it was just rumors and and buzz. As you know, John Michael mentioned, Shriner was like, "No way, I'm agreeing." through and through and now that it's a formal request in this open letter he's like I'm going to take this seriously uh, I, I don't think he's going to do it uh, you know uh, he, he says he wants to take time to think about it sure uh, you know he's a politician that can take things into consideration and maybe it's good to show that but we kind of saw some greens you know some grassroots greens countering this open letter saying if you want Mike so bad why don't you cross the floor and come sit with us in the house you know these parties have differed on policies too I I don't think this was maybe the right move I, I think this has rubbed a lot of liberals the wrong way but if nothing else this has been so entertaining for all of us to dig into and watch but you know Shriner is is a green for a reason we've said this a ton of times before that he punches above his weight he's a very effective opposition member and uh, as you said, you know, the Greens have not polled that well. I saw uh, David Coletto, our friend at Abacus, who's been on the podcast before, he said that he pointed out that the, you know, leadership approval around campaign time last year put Shriner six points behind where Stephen Del Duca was. And we know how it ended up for Del Duca. He didn't even win his own seat. And so I think this was a bit of a swing and a miss from the Liberals, but if nothing else, it's super entertaining for all of us watching. Well, and if I could add one other thing, I mean, I, I think the strongest argument, which, you know, I'll, I'll just present, uh, you know, in the name of fairness or whatever, but, uh, you know, the strongest argument for this is that um, the liberals are not just um, generally weak from the last election, that, that they are specifically worried about uh, volunteer recruitment and volunteer retention. They said that was a, a really huge problem in the last election, according to their own sort of um, party postmortem. Um, and they're they're really really afraid about what's happening with young voters. They they absolutely uh, are, are worried about uh, young voters primarily going to other parties. And uh, the the hope uh, from the proponents in this letter uh, was that you know somebody like Mike Schreiner could uh, you know not just bring. Uh, sort of generally speaking, new voters to the party um, or, or could, you know, uh, lessen the, the fragmentation of uh, votes on the left, uh, but specifically that it would bring in uh, young voters. And I mean, it's it's an idea, I, I but I, I don't think that, uh, well, you know, as Sabrina has said, I, I, I do think it's a bit of a swing and a miss. And, and I think that um, the, the, the proponents who signed this open letter, I think they um, misjudged where the party is, and uh, they, I think very clearly they were not uh, prepared for the really uh, harsh negative uh, reaction that it got from a lot of people in the party. You know, Mike Schreiner seems like a nice guy. You know, he was fine in the last debate. Uh, I wouldn't say that he did particularly well. He doesn't strike me as someone who can really be like a lightning rod for the youths. Um, you know, and you have someone like Nathaniel Erskine Smith, who's who's going to be running for the for the Liberal leadership, presumably. He is very much to the left of the Federal Liberal Party. He is a younger person. Uh, you know, he's he is 
uh, for animal welfare, and he has talked about you know marijuana use and stuff like that. He seems like the kind of person that could also bring youth youthful energy to the party. Um, so I I still get very confused about why Schreiner would have been identified as the answer. As Sabrina mentioned, his polling is it wasn't particularly great. He's not some you know third or fourth party leader who is really popular, more popular than his party, and people give him a break because he's not going to form a government. He's still just a moderately popular <laughs> figure within Ontario politics. Uh, so it it really just is very surprising to me and. I don't know if either of you, maybe John Michael, you want to get in on, on this, but even if he did run, would he even have much of a chance of winning? He has to win over liberals. Right. And so uh, there's a number of problems with this scenario. Um, first of all, as you've said, like he, he, he is popular. He's very well respected, um, but he's not overwhelmingly popular. Uh, I believe actually Main Street has just done a poll testing the idea of the Liberal Party led by Mike Schreiner. And... He's, I think, three or four points ahead of some of the other names, and you got to believe that that is mostly just name recognition. Um, you know, uh, outside of like, people who listen to this podcast, you know, people probably don't know Nate Erskine Smith or Yasser Nakvi um, off the top of their heads anyway. Um, but Mike Schreiner was on that debate stage last summer. Um, but yes, he has to, conv like, <laughs> Mike Schreiner is not going to be such a runaway uh, favorite with the liberal membership or with, you know, the general population that he's going to, you know, flood the party with new members. And, and he, you will have to convince existing liberals that a guy like Mike Schreiner is, is the uh, person to lead the party. And existing liberals are probably going to pre prefer somebody who is already a liberal, uh, who has a history with the party. And, you know, there's a, a substantial disagreement between, or I mean, we'll see how substantial the disagreements are, but you could look at the history of somebody like uh, Yasser Nakvi versus somebody like Nate Erskine Smith. Uh, you know, uh, Ted Shue, maybe less of a, a, a record in uh, politics so far, but still, you know, has uh, he did serve as an MP. He's got a record around Kingston. Uh, Bonnie Crombie would be a really interesting addition to the race. But these people all have, you know, a substantial history as liberal politicians. And they, they are going to have supporters within the Liberal Party. And the idea that even if he chose to run, that Schreiner, like, I mean, it's just, sorry, I mean, this is, I'm going to keep rambling here, but it, even if Schreiner were to, to run, it would be very bad for him to run and lose. And so this is sort of why I think Sabrina is correct. In the end, I think he's going to have to decide that it is not worth getting into it because he could only really do it if he was almost guaranteed a win. And he's not going to be. It, it is going to be a contested race. We, we already know that there will be multiple contestants. And I suspect that somebody like, uh, you know, Yasser Nakvi or Ted Shu or, or Nader Smith or any of the names that we have mentioned, uh, they are going to make a very substantial and compelling case to liberal members. And Sabrina... If Schreiner did run, you know, he's been leader of the Ontario Greens since 2009. Uh, he's the only one who's ever won a seat for them. If he ran, that would likely, it seems to me, almost kill the Green Party. They don't have anything. And if he ran and lost, then what happens? <laughs> and it's just, it, as you said, he probably won't do it because the paths just don't seem to make much sense. Yeah, I think there's probably too many variables and that's not always a good thing in politics. But you're right, you know, he's the only Green MPP in the House. He won this historic victory in 2018 by being the sole MPP there. He managed to hang on to that seat in Guelph. Um, and, you know, they've come really close, especially in Perry Sound, Muskoka, interestingly enough, where there was no Liberal candidate and they've had, uh, you know, the same candidate there run five times now and he's not ruling out a sixth run for 2026 yet. But but, you know, obviously he's had, this is their closest race. And so I think that they would probably do better to focus on growing the Greens uh, than, uh, than, you know, going over to the Liberals and the whole mess 
that that would create too. And actually, I would just add like something that you had said earlier, Eric, about Nader and Smith kind of being a thorn in the side of the federal liberals. I think that's going to give him an edge in the provincial liberal race because it's the Underhill theory, right? Like Ontario always votes the opposite provincially than they do federally. We elected Trudeau federally and a conservative premier Ford um, provincially. And so I think that, you know, kind of being a bit of a rebel on the Hill in, in Trudeau's cabinet might might serve him well uh, in the in the general election. But of course, as, as we've been talking about, he kind of needs to win the, the party race first. And, and just a counter thought, either of you can pick up on this, but uh, we have spent the last 20 minutes talking about the Ontario Greens and the Ontario Liberals. So while it is, you know, a weird story, uh, at least we're talking about these two parties, right? Yeah, I would say that it's not bad for the Liberals to be uh, in the news because the alternative is worse. Um, but the, uh, the the harm for the Liberals here is, is largely you know outside of the headlines, right? When we talk about that really, um, really strongly negative reaction that has happened uh, to this proposal within the party, right? Like, it, it, that's where you do risk creating a rift that would be uh, hard for the party to uh, get over. And, you know, I, I don't think we're there yet, but it's always possible to imagine, you know, um, look, it, it's going to be really hard for the Liberals to do really, really well in the next Ontario election, right? They, they might do better. <laughs> they, they certainly hope to do better than they did last time. But, you know, it's going to be a really big lift for them to form government in the, after the next election. And, you could imagine, because of course there's a history of this federally that we could talk about, but that's a long podcast. Um, you know, you could certainly imagine somebody saying, you know, if they don't form government after the next election, oh well, Mike Schreiner would have been the answer to this, right? And and you just have those that that long history of intra-party liberal fratricide continuing because this, you know, now that the idea is out there, it probably will never die. Well, if if Poiliev wins the next federal election, then. Maybe the Liberals suddenly in Ontario become the uh, the favorite just because of that balancing act that uh, well, and, and just that's mentioned. Well, and that's part of the, the context here is, I mean, there will have to be a federal election before the next provincial one. So, yeah. Um, Sabrina, I don't know if you, um, and I'll ask you, and if you don't have any answer, uh, John Mugg can give a shot at it, but do we have a sense of when the race will actually come to a close? I, I know that they're going to decide this at the convention, but... Are people thinking that this is something that's going to be resolved in 2023 or, or is it going to drag on? Yeah, um, nothing concrete, of course, just to preface this. But what I've heard is that there won't be a race for, you know, at least two years. And this is what I was hearing last year. So um, I would be really surprised if we're going to, there might be some deadlines this year, but I would be really surprised if we were going to get the Liberal leader this year. I think they want a bit of a longer runway. Um, and as you said, they're going to milk this for all, all it's worth, you know, and why not? They can get all those headlines that Marit Stiles and the NDP weren't able to get um, if they were to have a more competitive race there. Uh, and so I I think you know don't expect to get uh, anyone in place anytime soon and and there's a lot of complications with that too you know you mentioned there's uh, you know potentially the liberal leader they only have eight seats now they might not have a seat in the house and so I I think that they'll be focusing kind of on outside of the house anyway and in that sense um, they can have a bit of a longer runway to when they need to pick the leader before 2026 yeah I would say that's just yeah go ahead Oh, I would just say it's, it's sort of a, a mirror to what Sabrina was saying about uh, Marit Stiles not uh, expecting to, to spend a lot of time in the House. You know, we're still a pretty long way away from the next election, and I don't think that there's a, a huge premium in 2023 for the leader to be seen, you know, in the House, in front of the cameras at Queen's Park uh, all the time. Uh, that premium does start to go up as we get closer to the next election. So, yeah, I, I think you could sort of game out, um, you know, you don't need a leader before the end of 2023. As you start to get into 2024, you know, maybe they want to do what the NDP have done in effect and, and make sure that they have a new leader in place when the House returns in the winter of uh, 2024. So, you know, that gives you a deadline of, you know, February-ish of next year. Uh, but even that is not, you know, a hard and fast rule by any means. I do like the. I'm not a huge fan of these of open one member one vote uh, leadership races. Uh, as I've said before, I think it 
it, 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 it becomes just a, a contest to, to sell memberships, but uh, rather than actually a vision for the party necessarily. But primaries, I like the idea of that. Uh, having primaries, that seems like a lot of fun. And I wonder who, what part of Ontario would be the Iowa or the New Hampshire um, to set the set the pace for everybody. We'll do the Bay of Quinte. Will be uh, New Hampshire and uh, yeah, Waukesha the race County. For yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, then that means that we'll have lots of chances to chat again about this if we're actually only waiting till maybe next year to find a leader. So, uh, Sabrina and John Michael, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so thanks much. Thanks so much.